All right, so here we are, getting ready to study for our stats. First kind of big mini test, I guess that's an oxymoron. Um, but it is a pretty important test, and it covers chapters 1 through 5, and it's over exploring data, so here's a quick little review. All right, there's several things I want to talk about. The first thing I want to talk about is how do you find the median and or establish some type of information about the mean from looking at histogram alone. So this is um, the number of days of frost in April. Not really a big deal. I'm just looking for, a, I just grabbed a histogram here to look at. So if I'm trying to find the median, here's the process. Let's just pretend that there was um, 100, and I don't even know if this is exactly right, but let's just say that there was 100 pieces of data, 100 different Aprils that I looked at, so 100 years worth of Aprils. And that's how much data is collected here. For example, this bin um, of zero, so 15 of those years, so 15 Aprils in the past had no days of frost, whatever. This one was about maybe 12, whatever. So there's 100 total, so I want to find the median. Now, the formula where I take the total, plus 1, divide by the 2. This doesn't find the median for me. What it does is it finds the position of the median. So in this case, if I do uh, 101 divided by 2, this tells me that the median, the position of the median, is about 50.5. Now, that could change, because maybe there's only 75 pieces of data. Let's just pretend for a second. And you do 75 plus 1 is 76 divided by 2. You know, there could potentially be, it'd be the 38th piece of data in that case. And again, that's 38, where this one is uh, 50.5. So again, let's just go with the 50.5 first. We're trying to find out where's the 50.5 piece of data fall. So uh, there were 15 days here. Uh, here, well, let's, uh, and again, let's just say uh, 12. So, so far, 15 and 12 is 27. I'm looking for the 50th, about 50.5. So let's keep going here. There's five days here. So, so far, I'm at 32. I got to get to the 50th. So uh, in three here, there are again another 12. So that puts me at 44. And uh, right here at 4, there were approximately, on let's say, 7. So there I'm at 51. Okay, so if I go any more, I'm going to be well over. And again, so the 50.5 piece of data, that position, falls somewhere in this bin right here. So that means the median, well, since this is discrete data, where its exact value is not a range, this would actually be 4. The median would be 4 in this case. Um, so keep that in mind. That is how you find out. Now, if this was a bin that said, you know, 4 to um, 7 or whatever, then that's the, you, would, you wouldn't know exactly what the median is, but you would know at least where it's roughly located. Um, so that's how you kind of do it. That's the process that you go through. Let's just say it was this 38. You'd have to count until you find 38. So 15 and 12, we said was 27. 27 uh, plus 5 would be, that was 32. So then in this bin right here, we're going to obviously be over 38. So it would have to fall somewhere in this bin. Okay? Um, next would be, what do you know about the mean? Well, remember this data. Look at here. How would you describe this graph? I would describe it as skewed to the right. So that means the mean is going to go towards the tail. So if I'm predicting that the median is 4, the mean is probably going to be a little bit bigger. Um, so that is the process for how to find it. Now, be careful because sometimes histograms could be relative. For example, this histogram here represents how many, the number of letters in the words of Shakespeare's plays. So obviously that's a lot of words. So instead of looking at counts, because that would be a lot of words, we're looking at the percent of Shakespeare's words. For example, 5% of Shakespeare's words right here, um, I'm talking about this bin right here, 5% of his words have only one letter. So A, A, uh, I, so forth. Um, so to find the median here, well, a median is, remember, the 50th percentile. 50% 50 of data is above it, 50% of data is below it. So you just got to count until you find the 50th percent. Okay, so again, this is 5%, so obviously I'm not there yet. This is about, I don't know, we got a guess here, maybe 17%. This bin right here has, again, I'm not quite sure, let's say 23%. So I'm at 5 plus 17 plus 23. I'm at 45%. This next bin right here clearly has about 24 pieces of data in it. So at that point, I would have gone over 50% of total data so far. So that means the median has to fall somewhere in here. Once again, so the median would be four um, letters in the word. Um, however, be careful if that was continuous data where it was a value from here to here. You're not 100% sure exactly what the median is, but you know what it would fall in that bin. And again, another graph that's skewed right. So you'd say the mean is definitely a little bit higher because it's going to go towards these outliers 
or at least extremely high values over here. All right, next I wanted to talk about OJIVE. OJIVE is really important. Um, this is an OJIVE we did look at in class. Uh, what can you find in an OJIVE? First off, you can find the median by taking your 50th percentile coming straight over, or at least try to come straight, and then straight down. So maybe 29, 30, you know, I'm not very straight here, but you can find your median. You could also find your IQR. That's another important part that you can find because you can find the Q3 by finding the 75th percentile. That's a really good straight line. And then you can find Q1 by finding the 25th percentile. Just so good drawing straight lines. So let's just approximate. Let's say that the uh, Q3 is 50 and the Q1 is about 20. So that means my IQR would be approximately 30. Um, remember that we talked about what is a steep line means. It means there's a big percent of data there. For example, between 20 and 30, there's about 30% of data. So a big chunk of data is right there. If you go from 10 to 30, we're looking at potentially about 8 to... Oh, 60% of data. So think about that, for example. That's about 52% of my data. So almost half of all my data is from 10 to 30. So these short little unsteep lines over here represent a smaller percentage of your data, obviously. So that's why this data is skewed right, because most of my data is here, very little data at the high end. If we happen to have a line that was going straight across, no, that's not really straight across, but you get the idea. Straight across, that would actually show you that there was no data within that range. So let's just say that's what happened here. So between 90 and $100, there was no change of data. So 0% of people were between 90 and 200. So that is how to read an OJIVE. There's a lot you can get out of an OJIVE. Once you establish, or establish, not de-establish, establish that it's skewed to the right, then you could say, oh, I think the mean is probably going to be a little bit higher than 30 because it's skewed right, and usually the mean is going to go towards the tail of the data. So hopefully that will clear things up with the OJIVE. Make sure you can describe what a point means. For example, what does this point right here mean? Well, that's at 80% and at about $50. So that tells me that 80% of people spend $50 or less because that's what percentiles show. So that's an OJIVE. Make sure you're clear on all of that information. Next up, we need to come back. We haven't really talked about this in a while, but I want to do a real good talk here on independence. Independence, remember, means no association between two quantitative variables. Or, I'm sorry, this is too categorical. Apologize. Male, females, gender, that's categorical. Satisfied or not satisfied is categorical. By the way, this was this study was done with a thousand people that visited a hospital and they were asking them how satisfied were they with the hospital. So I want to determine, does my gender whether it's male or female, have an impact on how satisfied I was, whether I was not satisfied with the service of the hospital or I was satisfied. So remember, it doesn't start with the individual categories. It always starts with your total. So the first thing you would do, and I made this one real easy so you can, don't have to spend a whole lot of time figuring out the percentages, but the first thing you do is, okay, let's start with what percentage of people were satisfied. So that's 800 out of 1,000. So that's clearly 80%, right? So 80% of people were satisfied. Now, if that was truly independent, I should see 80% of people, I'm sorry, I should see 80% of females being satisfied, and I should see 80% of the males being satisfied. So let's do females first. So 416 out of 536. So 416 out of 536 is 78% were satisfied. So it's, uh, well, it's about 77.6. I'm around 78. So for some reason, if I'm a female, I'm slightly less likely to be satisfied. Um, male would be 384 out of 464. So 384 out of 464 is 83% approximately. So it's something about being a male makes me slightly more likely to be satisfied. So that would actually show not independence, okay, or no independence or not independent. Um, again, what does independence mean? It means you should see the exact same percentage of people that are satisfied and also the exact same percentage of um, people that are um, not satisfied. And it always starts with your totals. So you look at 800 out of 1,000 is 80%. You should see 80% of females being satisfied, 80% of males. So independence in terms of a chart would look like this. If I had males here, females here, um, and this was 0 to 1 or 100%, um, at the 80 mark, I should see 80% of males right, being satisfied. 
And I should also see, and this is a great chart. I mean, just look how beautiful this is. I should also see 80% of females that are satisfied. And the remaining 20%, look right there, 20% that are unsatisfied. So that remaining 20% of the males should be here. Remaining 20% of the females should be here. That is independence. If these bars are all uneven, like, you know, let's say 40% of guys are satisfied and 90% of females are satisfied, then that's clearly an imbalance and there's not independence going on here. So make sure you can use the numbers to um, show that and explain that in a, um, with a, uh, one of these categorical data tables here. Okay, so I hope I didn't make you dizzy there. All right, let's quickly talk about comparing distributions. Here's a picture of two distributions. Basically, what we had here was this was actually um, strawberries, and we were looking at a group of strawberries and whether they were discolored or not. And we found uh, this new spray that you can spray on your strawberries to make them last a little bit longer and not lose their color. I know, weird example, but whatever. And so we had a control group, ones that didn't get sprayed, and we got a treatment group, ones that did get sprayed. Um, we looked at their discolored discoloration 1 meaning they were um, not discolored at all and 10 meaning they were very discolored or kind of ugly and gross looking didn't want to eat them. So um, if we were asked to compare the distri two distributions just re make sure you remember your socks. You want to talk about shape, you want to talk about outliers, you want to talk about center, and you want to talk about spread. Now, if you're given the data, you could be very specific with these value, with these things, especially outlier, center, and spread. But if you're not, you just got to talk in general terms. So the shape, I would definitely say for the control group, I'm skewed to the left, whereas the treatment group looks roughly mound-shaped and symmetric. So you're comparing them. Are there any outliers? I really don't think so. I mean, just because this guy's out here all alone or there's two out here doesn't necessarily mean they're outliers. So really overall, I don't see any outliers in either one of them. The center, it looks like the center for the treatment group would probably be around a rating of 5, or the center for the discoloration group would maybe be around a 6.5. Just trying to balance it out by just looking. So you can men mention that the treatment group does seem to have a lower discoloration rating, which is good, meaning less discoloration. And you also want to talk about spread. Um, now, maybe the control group is slightly less spread out because it goes from 10 to 2, where uh, the treatment group goes 10 to 1. But hey, it's worth mentioning because you've got to mention those three things. So don't forget to mention those three things. If you actually know the data, you can calculate center. You could calculate spread by giving the mean or the medium. And if you give the mean, you'd give the standard deviation and describe what it means. Remember, small standard deviation means not very spread out, close to the mean, um, so not spread. Large standard deviation means you're very spread out, far away from the mean. Um, or if it's uh, skewed data, you'd want to give the median and the IQR, and you could calculate those from the data as well. So make sure you're remembering your socks when you're comparing distributions, or even just describing one distribution. All right, here's another example. Here's our two uh, box plot, box and uh, whisker plots here. Uh, there's no outliers shown um, in this particular one, um, just probably because there aren't any. So make sure what you can see. You could see range, max, minus, min. Remember, if there's an outliers, you would include them in the range. Uh, you can compare their medians. Looks like for the one cup here, and again, it's not a, not a big deal. I'm just trying to show you some pictures. It might not be a big deal that you understand what these numbers mean. But anyway, um, would maybe be around 13 grams, whereas for the three-fourths cup, it's around 10 grams. Um, make sure you talk about percentages when you're comparing these. For example, with the one cup, 50% of the one cup group is almost is bigger than almost all of the three-fourths cup group. So you can talk about or mention things like that as well. Uh, the IQR for the three-fourths cup group is obviously a lot smaller. I can mention that. Shape, this looks to be a little bit more symmetric right here, the three-fourths cup group. Um, who's more spread out? Clearly the one cup group is more spread out. Um, so a lot of things you can mention here. Um, is you know, A lot, of, lot more data right here. Uh, I'm sorry, not more data here. Remember, there's 25% data here, here here and here it's just this data right here is more spread out so let's just say we had some outliers and um, I don't think you could have negative grams but let's say there were some outliers this way those outliers combined with the more spread here would show that you're skewed to the left you're probably going to be skewed towards those outliers over there um, but even though that wouldn't make sense at least you can get a picture of what would go on there um, the last thing I want to mention is Remember the different types of graphs we have. We got um, the one that it might be mentioned would be a scatter plot. And a scatter plot is not meant to compare data at all. A scatter plot 
something that would look like this, is meant to find a relationship or an association between two quantitative variables. That is what it's for. So you're trying to find there's a relationship between two things, like does going faster around a track cause my heart rate to go up? Does um, running more cause my body temperature to go up? Um, does more fat in a hamburger cause that hamburger to have more protein? Um, so it's all about kind of a looking for a cause and effect relationship, or, or not necessarily cause and effect, but looking for an association. That's what a scatter plot's for. Stem and leaf plots can be used to compare distributions. Histograms can be made to compare distributions. Um, dot plots can be made to compare distributions. Time series plot is made to show change over time, so be careful with all that kind of stuff. So um, hopefully there's a, a kind of a quick review there, going over a couple things, but just kind of going over those few quick things there could really help you do um, well on the test. So good luck, study, read over everything, and um, make sure um, you're doing those multiple choice questions and um, looking over past videos for a little extra help, and uh, hopefully you're prepared for the test.